My name is Lee Hooker. And I'm Tim Hooker. And how did you come to be a megalithomania? Uh, Hugh kindly invited us down because he was interested in the work that we were doing in Ukraine and he realised that this was a bit of an unknown area generally. So he was uh, yes, eager to hear all about it and get us to tell the audience. And let's, let's, I mean, let's talk in broad terms first of all about megalithic sites generally. Um, why do you think that the engines went to such trouble to build them? I feel that it was a direct response to some experience, some phenomena that they had felt or observed and that is about as far as it goes. We, I don't think we want to overcommit ourselves. But what seems to be interesting is that the megalith building, as far as we can tell, was happening simultaneously across the world and day by day more and more sites seem to be being revealed. And a lot of sites we know took place at certain latitudes across the earth and there is a theory and it's something that I've got a lot of time for a theory that this was a response possibly to a disturbance in the way the earth was rotating perhaps in response to a cosmic catastrophe of something of that sort and a lot of the the records that are to do with uh, rock art to, in to do with megaliths, seem to record the fact that people across the globe were seeing the same phenomena and one would tend to expect that therefore they were looking at the skies and that the megaliths uh, from the uh, astronomical and celestial alignments that are so strongly associated with them would seem to be a response to, oh crikey, we really need to be keeping an eye on the heavens. What is going wrong with our world? Let's just keep an eye on the constellations, how things are moving, just in case whatever the, the rogue that has occurred may come back. That's one theory that I feel we've each got a lot of time yes. for. We, we see so many times where people talk about the megaliths and that they are, uh, have calendar alignments, solstitial alignments and everything. And, and certainly they have, but they, they keep holding back from answering the question as to why was this important? We hear of uh, the calendars being important for knowing when to sow crops, but you don't need uh, that sort of detail. Whereas if, for example, particular stars or constellations do not arise on time, then that could be uh, quite a significant warning that things were not all, uh, all well in the, in the cosmos. And how does, how does this relate to your own research in the Ukraine? What more particularly have you been discovering there? Um, our initial work in Ukraine was was hearing, well initially we were very interested in uh, Sumerian uh, um, information and, and data and histories, particularly the, some of the Sumerian gods that they had and we were astonished to discover that that these were also recorded in Ukraine but whereas in Sumer the records of writing go back to sort of like 3400 BCE uh, our friends in Ukraine were saying well we have these these Sumerian gods recorded in proto-Sumerian writing and this dates back 6000, 12000 BCE even back to 22000 BCE and we've, we've also got symbols writing recording the name of the culture Zarata uh, on mammoth skulls in red ochre <coughs> Excuse me, um, and that that's carbon dated at forty four thousand BCE. Wow! So to find the the sort of we we were aware from our Sumerian studies that even the Sumerians themselves were had their own archaeologists and were trying to work out where they they had originated from, and they had clear ideas about this. And there's a lot of mention in the records about the state of Arata. Um, and there's a lot of confusion as to where Arata might be, and a lot of suggestions as to where it could be. But to then come across Ukrainians who say, well, we, we have it recorded in writing here, in, uh, in grottos and caves. And there was the invitation, come and let us show you. And we're talking about a physically written records. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And what is it, cuneiform or...? or? It's, it's, it's pr pr proto, proto cuneiform. Um, the, obviously, trying to claim that there's a writing that is earlier than Sumer is very contentious. Indeed. And the person who's done the most work on this is a Ukrainian um, Sumerian scholar by the name of Anatol Kofishin. And Kofishin went to the, the most ancient site in Ukraine, a site called Stone Grave. 
and at Stone Grave there is this series of grottos that Tim was talking about and the grottos are lined with marks. Now you may say they just look a complete mess of scratchings but Kofishian quite remarkably could see in the pattern here and there just the odd wisps of what looked like Sumerian writing and as a Sumerian scholar clearly he responded to this with enormous interest. So what he did was moved himself lock, stock and barrel to this site near Melitopol and when he was there he just went into the caves day after day after day simply to look and to record and from that he was able to start to pick out small sections that were looked like phrases. Mm -hmm. Now he already knew some of the signs and was then looking for consistency so from that he very slowly built up a record and is started by producing a volume that is, golly, about three inches thick, mm. just on this one set of grottos, the very earliest ones that they excavated. They've now been preserved in sand. And his record is showing that what you have there is the names of the Sumerian gods. For example, we have the name of Enlil. You have the name of Anu. We Gatum have the Dug. name of Gatam Dug. And the... Yes, in Anna, mm -hmm. but also the fact that there was the most amazing section of text that he came across that was showing that the goddess Gatam Dug, obviously associated with Sumer, was tried by something called a water court and removed in favour of the goddess in Anna. Mm -hmm. Now, that is also recorded remarkably in one of the temples at Hat al Hayak. In Turkey which is somewhat west of Gobekli Tepe. So we know that Hat al Hayek and its wonderful temple system is probably dated to around 8000 BC. So they, there is a record at Stone Grave of the pilgrimages that were made between that ancient temple at Hat al Hayek that went by the name of Shu Eden Onki Dug and also the temple at near Melitopol, which was called Shu Nun. So there is an absolute cast iron cross check that we're talking about the same culture. What is perhaps contentious again is not only the fact that this is recorded as writing, um, but the fact that this written script is describing a culture that goes by the name of Arata, A-R-A-T-T-A. -A the Sumerians say they do derive themselves from Arata, but the locus of that is up for grabs. Mm -hmm. There's a very strong claim in uh, ancient Persia that they have that site, but associated with Arata are certain conditions about the region, the sort of minerals that go with it. And the archeologists in Ukraine feel that they have a very, very strong case to offer for the kingdom of Arata. So we're talking about a, a, a relatively recent excavation in Ukraine. How long since the discovery? Um, the discovery, I, I suppose, would be made 20, 30 years ago. Um, oh, really? That far back? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Was, um, certainly back in Soviet times. Uh, the difficulty is that since this earliest civilization is found very much on the territory of Ukraine, um, in Soviet times that was fair enough because it was, uh, if you like, the Soviets could make the first claim to having the first civilization. Now, of course, um, times have moved forwards. Ukraine is independent and uh, there is a political issue uh, um, here. And how, how big, how big a, um, a cache of records are we talking about? I mean, Stone Grave itself has got, uh, at, the, at the moment, they have found 63 grottos there. Um, in each grotto, uh, there are different locations, be it on the left wall, the right wall, the ceiling, door lintels. And so each grotto has got, say, four or five different locations uh, of areas of script, some of which are huge, um, say something like seven metres across, uh, three or four metres high, just smothered in petroglyphic writing, proto-Sumerian writing. So there's a, there's a huge amount of information there. No, sorry, for, forgive me. My understanding of cuneiform is that it's made by indentations into wet clay. Yes. Uh, how does this translate into a petroglyph, which is presumably onto a hard rock wall? It's an excellent question. Yes. That's an excellent question. Um, what you're looking at is this, the individual strokes, where you don't get the wedge shape 
that okay. is so distinctive to the cuneiform. So if you can imagine just the stroke without the wedge, but there is also, and I don't know how Kafishin did this, um, a sense of direction, because we are obviously used to script, you know, uh, on a sort of left-right plane, uh -huh. whereas in this cave, it can take many forms, you know, it can be on the vertical, on the horizontal, even slanted or, or wound around the edge of something. So the, the logistics of how he was able to do it evade mm -hmm. us entirely. But if anyone were to look at the book and just just look at the very, very careful way he defragments all this information and then starts to build it up again, I think you would be left in very little doubt that what you're looking at is a, a script that has its own internal coherence. And it's something that he feels very sure has the makings mm. of the later Sumerian language, hence his reasons for yeah. calling it Proto-Sumerian. Wow. The, the, there are many texts where, for example, so many of the records are also recorded in uh, Cahal Hayek uh, and duplicated. And within his book, he will show clearly, here is the text in written at Cahal Hayek, here it is in Proto-Elamite, and here it is even earlier, and takes it right back to, here's the, the equivalent record at Stone Grave. So you can see the evolution of the of the script, and that uh, and that there is uh, clearly a parallel here. And dating dating is a hugely contentious issue mm. in 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 the archaeology, mm. in, yes. in earth mysteries, in all of the the, the new discoveries. Um, and we've seen Michael Tellinger today talk about dates that are quite mind boggling. You know, mm. yes. two mm. quarter of a million years yes. in some yes. cases, which you know, if, if they can be corroborated, and then let's hope they can really is going to force us to re-examine a lot of this material. Now when you talk about Proto-Sumerian, um, are we going to be having to, to re-examine when we think the rise of the Sumerian culture was? Uh, to some extent, yes, I think that that's a, a fair question. Uh, some of the caves have got organic remains in and so can be carbon dated. Some of the Proto-Sumerian script has been done uh, with charcoal which again can, can be carbon dated. Mm -hmm. Others are, are incised into the rock. Uh, it's, it's very hard sandstone, but nonetheless, the, the characters have been inscribed into the rock. And by looking at the, the pattern, the depth of the pattern on the rock, that also gives uh, a good indication as to what age. Um, Confucian himself, though, is, is very open, uh, delightfully open in saying, um, these are my translations, these are the best that we can do so far, uh, I welcome other interpretations, uh, mm. but but he's saying what is perfectly clear here is that we have the names of the proto-Sumerian gods, we have reference to water courts, divination, um, <coughs> and law codes, and that there is clearly a, a, a civilized society here. And uh, presumably there are echoes as well of, of, of other people's research, so looking at yes. Nibiru, Tiamat. And yes, yes. Uh, and and are these are, are names that are cropping up as well? Um, not, not, not the name not, Nibiru. Not Nibiru, and, and I haven't come across uh, Tiamat. Kafishin's book, is it's heavy going to translate, and mm. as he says, out of 63 grottos and sort of uh, half a dozen panels in each, he said, we've only looked so far at, um, should we say, about a fifth, and, and not all of that is in his present book. Um, and it's clearly going to be a life's work for him. Tiamat may well may well yet appear. And are there? Is it known if there are uh, megalithic structures in the vicinity? Um, well, Stone Grave itself is an absolutely enormous megalith. It's made up of a series of layered stones, and it is simply vast, truly vast. It's something that is not just venerated by the local population in Ukraine, but it's still a site of pilgrimage for Tibetan lamas, um, who's, I mean, the Dalai Lama has come to visit this site because the Tibetans feel a very, very strong link. I can't put it any more strongly they than that. They see it as their origin point, but, don't they? Yes, the fact that they see it as their origin point would seem to concur with the archaeologist um, doctor uh, or professor Yuri Shilov who used to be with the National Academy of Sciences in Kiev and has now uh, set up his own museum to manage to share this and in fact it's Dr Shilov's books that we are currently translating as fast mm -hmm. as we can to sort of bring this out so that other people can work on it, digest it and hopefully take it to bits 
you know, and put it together again, just to see how it fits in with other data. Um, we feel his work is 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 vastly important, um, as his colleague um, Dr. Kafishin as well. Let's let's just talk for a second about uh, why ancient sites such as this and others, of course. Why do they have such a pronounced effect on on people today? Do you think? Mm -hmm. mm. It the, the, there's a lot of interest here in in what we're finding in Ukraine. It's sort of it, it comes down to sort of why are some sites, um, if you like, deemed sacred? What makes a site a special site? Uh, you can look at some areas, some megalithic constructions, and think: Is this area, is this site uh, special because of the constructions which are here, or have they built here because the site itself is special? Uh, clearly, we we would aspire to the latter. But you then have to look around and say, so what has made this this special? Now, what we find in, in Ukraine is that uh, a considerable number of their burial mounds, they call them kurhans, um, it's, it's a bit like a barrow that we would have uh, in Britain, uh -huh. except that they are layered constructions rather than just heaps of earth over, over a body. I was perhaps putting it a little simplistically, but they're very uh, uh, particularly layered and, and layered in a two-dimensional design as well as three-dimensional. Now, these sites are always over mantle channels and usually wherever possible on promontories surrounded by water. So where, for example, you have two rivers coming into a, a main river system, there you've got a promontory between the, the rivers. And where we've got fault lines, geological fault lines, over mantle channels going down to the Earth's mantle below the Earth's crust, because the mantle rocks have a different density to the crustal rocks, you get a difference in the sort of what we call the mass field. Now, this is a very much a new area of physics which is being explored by one of our colleagues uh, uh, in Ukraine, uh, Dr. Vladimir Krasnoholovets, who's done a considerable amount of pioneering work uh, on this. But it seems as though, the, the if you like, the Earth energies, um, for want of a better term, in these areas over mantle channels are different to elsewhere and that there's uh, records that this can be um, have some sort of influence on consciousness mm. putting it simply i suppose it's a bit like saying the ancients were aware somehow or other uh, subconsciously that these places felt special and we can now relate that and say yes but they are on geologically interesting areas mm. how that actually comes about is 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 really a, a, an open question but we see that in ukraine that uh, these burial kurhans are on geologically significant sites and and one wonders how did the ancients know about that but, but clearly they do Interesting. interesting. Yes. Well, in fact, I was going to follow up with saying, you know, we, we do find that there is a draw to ancient megalithic sites mm -hmm. and, and what we, we commonly refer to as earth energies. Mm -hmm. It yes. seems as though we're now starting to reach a point where, where technology is catching up with, mm. with, you know, mythology and magic, if you like. Yes, yes. I, yes, I, I, I yes. believe so. And, and mythology simply seems to be a history that we've lost sight of or, you know, have serious doubts about. And it's, um, it seems to be one of those emotional barriers that some people find it very difficult to go through. You know, thinking, golly, if there were an historical original for some of these mythical characters, that sets up a lot of concern in some, certainly some scholarly quarters, because it really upsets the apple cart. Indeed. And Indeed when you have a, a wonderful system of laid down doctrine in terms of our university scholarship, it's it's would take a brave person to w wish to disturb that but nevertheless you know we live in an evolving society every day mm -hmm. we wake up to something new and different and it would be nice to think that learning and scholarship and the way we record uh, and interpret events could also you know move with the times as well but i think there's a great reluctance to revisit material to accommodate the new information that's coming through. I, th I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the, one of the things that's coming through very strongly at the moment um, is, is the issue of dating, as, as we've yes. said. Yes. Why, perhaps you can expand on that just a little. Why is it, do you think, that academe and orthodox archaeology is so reluctant to push back the boundaries, if you like, of how old things really might be? Well, mm. my, my personal opinion is, is for the reason I've just stated. It's the fact that it, it disturbs the status quo so much 
Um, the other difficulty I think that the professionals have, to, to be fair, is that it's incredibly difficult to date accurately. We have come up with more and more sophisticated technologies in ways of, of dating. I mean, there are dedicated units to this, such as the Carbon Dating Unit in Oxford, which is excellent at trying to refine the data. But when one is dating with carbon-14, which is generally what's used, the excellent man who came up with that idea, Libby, was saying at the time, all this is well and good, so long as one lives in a stable atmosphere, mm. so long as you have a stable, you know, hydrosphere, ionosphere, atmosphere, then all is fine. Mm. That means a world without volcanoes erupting, without comets passing through, you know, without earthquake activity, mm. and of course, and solar, and, and, and solar activity. So there is always this this flux and change. And the world simply isn't like that, of course. <laughs> no, yes. no. So the, the trouble is, you know, you're having these lifts and falls. In, in the natural background, you know, to read all the time. So it, it's, it's incredibly difficult, even making allowance for change. If, if we look at, at, at the global phenomena of megalithic sites, let, let's set aside the issue of, of precise dating for the time mm -hmm. being. Let's just call them prehistoric. Like yes. Technically yes. what they are so far. Um, there are marked similarities um, in terms of location, construction mm -hmm. methods, mm -hmm. Um, alignment to the telluric or magnetic mm. energies, mm. Um, alignment to, to stellar bodies, the sun, the moon, the stars. What do you think is at the heart of that? Why do you think that there are such similarities in such widely disparate areas globally? Mm -hmm. A simple answer, I think. Mm. We had a global civilization. People that talked to mm. each other and people that traded and shared. Um, mm. What is notable in Ukraine is that what seems to have been the last vestige of this ancient Arata civilization is a civilization that in Ukraine calls itself or is called Tripilian and in Romania and Moldova is called Kukutani and in that civilization um, you you just see items recorded there that well I mean perhaps you'd like to sort of give a little bit more detail on the sort of the <laughs> that side of it. Um. We, we're very interested to see that the society in those days was completely maternal. And, and also uh, completely peaceful. And completely peaceful. No, no weapons have yeah. ever been found yes. in that culture. A uh, very harmonious society. And at some particular stage, historically, as you say, it's difficult to put a precise date on these things, um, but society became far more uh, paternally uh, patriarchal and, and more aggressive. And at this particular time, we also noticed that, that there was far more of a reverence for deities in the sky rather than deities in the earth. And we see this sudden changeover from, from being sort of maternal earth goddess uh, reverence to a sort of paternal sky god um, acknowledgement. What do you ascribe um, that to? Well, it's almost as though the ancients suddenly had their focus of attention drawn from the land uh, to sort of what is going on up in the heavens that is different, something has changed, and something which was sufficiently, shall we say, fearful to cause them to pay heed to it. Um, I think this is maybe one of the reasons why some of these uh, megalithic monuments and, and sites are so astronomically aligned. I, th I think there was a disturbance, um, and they, they, they witnessed this. I, I, w I would agree with that, yeah. but I feel it goes almost, or probably, hand in hand with um, a shift in the topic of the moment, consciousness. And what these Tripilian cultures were recording on their pottery were the most exquisite images, truly beautiful swirls. Mm -hmm. the, the swirls that everyone admires so much at Newgrange can be found several thousand years before on the ceramics of the Tripilian culture, the, those very, very distinctive centre-locking spirals. Um, and so often those are, seem to be recorded, or we, we, this is our poor interpretation, you know, just, just generally, it's very difficult, to, it's, it's so subjective in the end. But when you see the same sort of circles then occurring out in Malta in the caves, somewhere near the top, i.e. I the resonant space in the room, 
One is thinking, is this something to do with a change in resonance, a change in the vibration of the planet? Is this something to do that is affecting people's consciousness and, you know, de depressing the sort of the, the, the placid feminine side and, and bringing forth perhaps that more aggressive male mm. elbows out kind of society? Mm. What, whatever happened mm. at that stage, there was an enormous change in human behaviour and, you know, the fact that trade and economy seemed to be suppressed in favour of warfare. Mm. So the, the cooperation is out and conquest is in. Indeed, yes. you put it beautifully. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, do you think that it's, it's wise or do you think it's feasible to consider that the ancients were intentionally leaving messages for us as their antecedents? Positively. Uh, descendants, rather? Positively. What do you think well, they were trying to tell us? Positively. Um, I feel that what they were trying to tell us is that uh, they had experienced some phenomena, as I was explaining earlier, that they would like to perhaps leave a message for the future. You know, this is what we went through. This is how we responded to it. We do not live on a planet that is stable. It's, it's always changing. I mean, we are aware of this in small ways in our society. It's just that in the West we seem to be fairly insulated. It's come as a great surprise to us at the time of this filming, the fact that this volcano in Iceland has gone mm. on and has caused such enormous disruption, something we're absolutely not used to, having to deal with natural phenomena in that way. Mm. But it's uh, impinged on us. Um, and I feel it must have been such an incredible statement to these ancient people that they felt the need to record it in some tangible, solid way. So a warning from history. Yes, indeed. Mm. We see, for example, the flood records in so many cultures. Um, and although it's difficult, to, again, to date those, to say, oh, they're all expressions of the same, a record of the same flood, maybe they're multiple floods, but we see uh, from Ukraine with the flooding of the Black Sea in from the Mediterranean, uh, there was a connection prior to that with the Aratan civilization in southern Ukraine and with Mesopotamia and Sumer and to uh, Anatolia and, and Turkey. The, the trail of uh, the, the, the ruling priest castes between Katal Hayek, for example, and Stone Grave in southern Ukraine was, was very evident but there comes this time when uh, the Black Sea is flooded through and, and that territory is lost and, and, and the two cultures became separated. Um, I think something as dire as that, sweeping away the majority of their civilization, they would want to leave a record of. Which begs the question, what mm. is under the water? Yeah. And this is where we so admire the research work of Graham Hancock, you know, where he very astutely cottoned on to the fact that perhaps a lot of the cultures that we would like to investigate, where there's the missing factors in records, are still lying undiscovered underwater. Mm -hmm. And hopefully there are moves afoot, you know, to, to set some funds towards exploring mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lee and Tim Hook, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Megalithomania. Megalithomania.